Um, our next piece is a new, um, newer uh, piece by a composer named Arvo Pert. He's a living composer. This was written in uh, 1977. It's a piece called Fratra. It's for cello and piano. Um, however, he's intentionally arranged it for several different ensembles. Um, chamber orchestra, violin and piano, solo violin and chamber orchestra. And um, it's an incredibly powerful and ethereal piece that I really, as a listener and a player, I've, I've really kind of never experienced a piece quite like this. Um, weirdly enough, I first heard this piece at, uh, in the uh, movie There Will Be Blood. And it was during this montage, this big industry montage, where the main character is moving up in the business of oil. And he's not a likable character if you haven't seen the movie. And, um, it's about ambition and drive. But this piece was completely captivating to me and distracting. I was wondering, what is this amazing piece for cello? It's gorgeous. Years went by. I never found out what it was. I played it in chamber orchestra and still never put it together. And then finally, Sarah and I were sitting down designing this program. And she put it on. She's like, oh, light, there's this really cool piece for uh, cello and piano. And I heard it, and finally it clicked after all those years. And I got so excited, I like slammed my fist down on the table. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, right? we have to play this. So, um, anyway, I'll have one last personal anecdote about this piece. I recently visited my goddaughter um, a few weeks ago in Vermont. She'd just been born, she's about two weeks old at the time. And my, my good friends and I were sitting in bed, the mom and I were sitting just hanging out with the, with the little baby. And uh, I put this piece on, and the baby started to respond to it. Two week old child. She started to breathe in the rhythm to the music. And it was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. And it's, I'm going to get tears. Anyway, um, so this is um, Fratra for cello and piano. Yes. Uh, so one of the amazing things that Katie, Katie was saying about this piece being uh, just very meditative is the theme comes back I think, seven different times um, in different uh, registers on the piano, different variations on the cello. So while listening, the theme is... Thank you. 
thank uh, specifically Sugar, Sugar Vendel, and Linda McBride. Thank you guys so much for having us here tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, where is Linda? Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you guys. And thank you for coming. Thank you, of course. Um, please join us. There's going to be reception in the back, I believe. Yes, there will be wine and uh, refreshments. And I realized that I forgot to quote the parrot. So if you want to know what the quote for the parrot was, please ask me at the reception. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say it now. Um, for our last piece, um, it's a amazing piece. Again, I just love all the pieces we did, but I especially love this one because uh, this is a piece by Piazzolla, who's one of my favorite composers, is for Piazzolla. Uh, this is Le Grand Tango for cello and piano. And this piece to me is just like classic Piazzolla. It's just groovy, it has a lot of heartfelt beauty, sad, funereal music, and then it goes crazy <coughs> at the end, and that's just, to me, very Piazzolla. Um, a little bit about his life and why Paris is so significant for him is that uh, as a young Argentinian composer, he was experimenting with the form of the tango and writing it into his music, but he was a classically trained musician. Uh, and Argentina did not like that so much. He actually received a lot of death threats and eventually was ousted by his own country for violating the form of their most beloved music. So he left and uh, moved to Paris, where he studied with Nadia Boulanger, a uh, very famous tutor and mentor to a lot of uh, prolific composers of our time. And he started writing uh, very strictly classical music. What? Oh, I said it's that even. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, I forgot. <laughs> um, so he started trying to write classical music, and it wasn't going so well. And one day he was practicing his tango stuff, and Nadia was like, what is this? This is amazing. And he said, oh, th this is nothing. I, I don't do this anymore. She's like, no, this is you. This is what you should be doing. And so she really encouraged him to start playing with the tango again. Eventually he does. Long story short, he becomes internationally acclaimed. Argentina, uh, Argentina invites him back. <laughs> and they say, you're our hero. You've done so much for us. But he had to leave in order to gain recognition and come back and finally accept it. So I can't think of a more significant uh, role that a city could possibly play in somebody's life and sh shifting it as much as, as his. Um, I will read the quote for this one. And it's one of the most classic quotes, classic piece for a classic quote uh, from A Movable Feast. If you were lucky enough to have lived in Paris as a young man, then wherever you go for the rest of your life, it stays with you, for Paris is a movable feast. Thank you very much, again, and we hope that you enjoy.